Good morning. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. You know, I, I've heard that song, obviously, a number of times now. And I know uh, it is said that it refers to his coming again. But I thank God Almighty that he came <laughs> and that he is coming again and that he cannot be stopped and that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess Jesus Christ as Lord to the glory of God the Father. And I just thank him for that, that, uh, oh, oh, may he come soon. It's just such a joy to know that he came once to bring salvation, and he comes again to bring us home. <laughs> thank you, Lord. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you that this amazing, gracious, loving plan of yours was set before the earth was here, before we took our first breath. You knew that this day would come, and Father, you knew that we would be anxiously looking forward to this world being turned right side up again. Father, we thank you for your word, and it is bringing forth the things that you would have it to bring. Lord, we thank you that your word is life to us. It's health to us. And Lord, as we listen today to your word as it is brought, we thank you that it is not just going out here, but Father, everywhere where your word is, we do pray for open hearts and open ears. Father, that we would listen and be obedient to what you have for us, for that is our health and our happiness and our joy beyond all joy to know that the Lord Jesus is coming again, and he is coming soon. We feel it, and we look forward to it. And in the meantime, Father, we lift our brothers and sisters in Christ to you. Father, we know that wherever they are today, for those that are experiencing the joy of life, we ask that you would continue to bless them. And Father, those who are experiencing the difficulties of this life, those who are being persecuted for your name's sake, Father, I pray that your spirit would give them that joy that would transcend any hurt and any pain they may feel because it's all for your honor and all for your glory. And we do thank you for that. Father, we just thank you for this day again, for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone here on this chilly Sunday. And those of you online, I'm the uh, backup B-team announcer for this morning because Pete is out of town. Um, real quick, the men's... Tuesday Bible study resumes on 19 January. That would be the third uh, uh, third Tuesday of the month. Uh, that Tuesday men's Bible study meets uh, every first and third Tuesday of the month. So we resume on the third Tuesday of January. That's the 19th. The uh, ladies Bible study has no schedule yet um, published yet. So uh, we will put the word out when that is to resume. The Friday men's breakfast at 7 a.m. at Brit's Cafe is scheduled for the 8th of January, but may be uh, delayed or postponed a week depending on the weather because uh, Walt's not sure if they're uh, required seating outside. And, and so um, you don't want frozen pancakes for breakfast. So, And lastly, um, if you've... Uh, on your giving, if you've updated your address, if you've moved in the last 12 months, uh, please let the church know so we can make sure your uh, giving statement for the year 2020 is sent to the right address and that there's no delay there. And um, if you are planning on giving and want it counted uh, before uh, 2020, make sure that you get it uh, postmarked uh, prior to 1 January so that it can be counted properly for uh, the entire uh, fiscal year, which is calendar year uh, 2020. And uh, that's all I have. Thank you, Jim. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Hope everyone had a Merry Christmas. Well, it is hard to believe that 2020 is 
almost over, but how many of you are glad to see it go? <laughs> the year of the coronavirus, that's right, Mark. Well, it's good to see you this morning. I guess for many of us, it was way too cold to get out of bed this morning. Well, <laughs> less than 12 months. Well, welcome for those of you that are joining us on Facebook, and uh, we trust the Lord will speak to your heart and challenge us this morning. You know, if 2020 has taught us anything, it's that we never know what tomorrow will bring. Next Sunday... <laughs> will be a new year. We don't know what's ahead, but we can prepare. We can prepare ourselves spiritually for tomorrow, and we can make ourselves available for ministry to the church body. Because we do know this, that God wants to use us all for the work of the ministry. He wants to use us as a church to make Christ known. But to use us, we need to make ourselves ready, and we need to make this church whole. Every one of us has a role to play. And so I pray that you will seek the Lord's will concerning a place of ministry within this body. Now, I realize that not everybody is ready to return yet. This pandemic still has a lot of people uh, not ready to come back, and we don't know if it's going to get worse yet. We trust that with the vaccine coming out, it'll subside and things will smooth out and get better, and everybody will come back and prepare to be involved in the ministry. But I pray that you will seek the Lord's will concerning a place of ministry within this body because we have all been saved to serve. That is one thing that we know the Word of God teaches. And uh, as we will see in our text today and in the weeks to follow as we go through the book of Acts, that's one of the things that the Word of God teaches. Today we're going to get back to Acts, and we're going to see a, a man who left Jerusalem with a malicious intent to persecute Christians, the followers of the way. And he wanted to execute and imprison those who were following the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet, on his way to persecute Christians, he would have a confrontation with the one who he was persecuting. He didn't think that he was persecuting the Lord Jesus. In his mind, he was persecuting the followers. But he would soon discover that when he was persecuting the followers of Jesus, he was, in fact, persecuting the person of Jesus Christ. Now, I hope you realize that when we talk about a conversion to Jesus Christ, every conversion is a huge miracle. Because the conversion of someone to faith in Christ is someone coming from death to life. They're being converted from darkness to light. And every conversion, no matter how insignificant it may seem, it's a, it's a miracle of God. Now, there are some people, however, that, that seem so much farther away from the truth. There are some who, some people think they would never follow the Lord Jesus Christ, so we in our own minds, we're just amazed that somebody that, that seems unlikely to be a follower of Jesus Christ would follow the Lord Jesus. And we stand in amazement at the incredible power of God when God gets a hold of someone and it seems that they would, be, would have been so impossible to reach. And yet we need to realize that nobody is beyond the reach of God. No one. I don't care how wicked they may seem to us. I don't care how vile they may be. 
And it's not our place to look at someone and conclude that they are so far gone that they are unable to be reached with the gospel. For example, you may have heard of a man named John Newton. Maybe you've not heard of John Newton, but I'm certain you've heard of the song Amazing Grace. John Newton is the author of the song Amazing Grace. Now, he was a wicked slave trader. And I'm certain if our cancel culture of today had gotten a hold of, if they knew uh, that he was the author of the song Amazing Grace, they would rip that hymn out of all the hymnals. But of course, uh, they would just as soon get rid of the church altogether anyway. But there came a day when this wicked man survived a terrible storm at sea and after reading uh, a classic by uh, Thomas Akempis, The Imitation of Christ, the seed was planted and he eventually trusted Christ and he was radically converted. And he would write his own epitaph and he wrote these words, John Newton, clerk, once an infidel and libertine, a servant of slavers in Africa, was, by the rich mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, preserved, restored, pardoned, and appointed to preach the faith that he had long labored to destroy. He had once, he had once sought to destroy the Christian faith. There's another unbelievable conversion to the Christian faith. A man who was known as Commander Mitsuo Fuchida. Believe it or not, he was the commander of the Japanese Air Force that led the attack at Pearl Harbor. And he was a Buddhist, but he decided to read the Bible after hearing, reading the testimony of an American who survived a Japanese prison camp for three and a half years. And this American had become a missionary to Japan. And Fushida writes, In the ensuing weeks, I read this book eagerly. I came to the climactic drama, the crucifixion. I read in Luke 23, 34, the prayer of Jesus Christ at his death. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I was impressed that I was certainly one of those for whom he had prayed. The many men I had killed had been slaughtered in the name of patriotism, for I did not understand the love that Christ wished to implant within every heart. Right at that moment, I seemed to meet Jesus for the first time. I understood the meaning of his death as a substitute for my wickedness, and so in prayer I requested him to forgive my sins and changed me from a bitter, disillusioned ex-pilot into a well-balanced Christian with purpose in living. That date, April 14th, drama, the second day to remember of my life. On that day, I became a new person. My complete view on life was changed by the intervention of the Christ I had always hated and ignored before. And Fujita became an evangelist, even speaking in the U.S. And he wrote a gospel tract. And in his testimony pamphlet, he wrote this. He says, I would give anything to retract my actions of 29 years ago at Pearl Harbor, but it is impossible. Instead, I now work at striking the death blow to the basic hatred that infests the human heart and causes such tragedies. And that hatred cannot be uprooted without assistance from Jesus Christ. And you know, we could go on and on and on of telling testimonies of men and women over the last 20 centuries who seem very unlikely who would have ever put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And perhaps some of you here would have testimonies and some of you watching and listening on Facebook have similar testimonies that seem unlikely to have ever put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and yet God is a worker of miracles. And yet, no conversion, I believe, to the Christian faith has made as much an impact on the world and on the Christian faith as the conversion of a Jewish Pharisee named Saul of Tarsus. Now, first of all, we discover that he is initially called Saul, but today, as we talk about him, I may call him Paul because that's the way I have come to know him. And, and so whether I call him Saul or Paul, I just want you to know that he's got, he goes by both names. Saul is his pre-conversion name. Paul is his post-conversion name. But whatever I call him, you know who I'm talking about, right? So, but he has been the most influential of all the apostles writing 13 letters in the New Testament from which the bulk of our New Testament doctrine has been developed. Especially soteriology, which is the doctrine of salvation, and ecclesiology, which is the doctrine of the church. I remember uh, one of my theology professors in Bible college, Dr. Bragg, wrote one of our textbooks called Pauline Theology. And uh, Paul was responsible for much of our theology in the New Testament. But it was the Apostle Paul who actually clarified the gospel for us in his writings. Now, if you would ask the average Bible-believing pastor, other than the Lord Jesus, who is their hero in the New Testament, And I have to qualify that as Bible-believing pastors because I hope you know that there are a lot of pastors today that don't really believe the Bible. But I would say that probably the vast majority of them would say the Apostle Paul. If there was anybody in the New Testament that I would want to be like, I would have to say it's Paul. He set an example for all of us. And we'll see Saul's salvation experience in Acts chapter 9. And then in chapters 10 through 12, we're going to see a little bit more of Peter and his ministry. But then we see Peter kind of fade out. We'll see him again in chapter 15. But from chapter 13 on to the end of the book of Acts in chapter 28, we see Paul's ministry rising to prominence. And we see his ministry and the effectiveness, and I believe that there's several things that will help us in our own walk of faith. And he's going to show us how we can more effectively reach the loss for Christ. And he's going to show us how we can persevere when we're being persecuted and our faith is being tested. And I believe he can show us how to be bold when we need to stand up for our faith in a culture that is doing everything it can to stop us and to shut us up. You know, there there really is a movement underfoot in this country trying to silence us regarding certain issues of great importance. And Paul shows us how we can take a stand when those forces are trying to stop us and trying to keep us quiet. I just finished a great book by Erwin Lutzer, and I gave a copy of that book to all of my leaders called We Will Not Be Silence, Responding Courageously to Our Culture's Assault on Christianity. And I really would encourage every Christian to read this book because it's very instructive as to what's happening in our culture, but it gives a a very balanced and instructive view of what's happening in our culture and in our country today. It gives some sound biblical advice to believers on how to remain faithful. And uh, I'll make mention of that in a few minutes again, but Anyway, Paul's story is amazing, and it's so amazing that we see his testimony mentioned three times in the book of Acts. 
The other two are found in Acts chapter 22 and verse 1 through 16, and again in Acts 26, verses 4 through 18, as Paul has opportunities to give his testimony. One author gives his assessment of Paul when he says this. He says, it is fitting that such a unique individual would have a unique conversion. Saul was by birth a Jew, by citizenship a Roman, by education a Greek, and purely by the grace of God a Christian. He was a missionary, a theologian, evangelist, pastor, organizer, leader, thinker, fighter for truth, and lover of souls. Never has a more godly man lived except for the Lord himself. And so it's really no wonder why I want to be like him, and I hope that by the time we get finished with the book of Acts, he becomes a hero to you, and you would like to be like him. Now, when I read about him as a believer in Acts, he truly becomes a role model for every believer. He was born in Tarsus in the Roman province of Cilicia, and he was a, a Pharisee who studied under Gamaliel, who was the most respected rabbi of his day. And his dedication as a Pharisee to Jehovah God was unsurpassed by any Jew in Israel. Now, I, wanna, I want you to follow along with me in Acts chapter 9. Is there? There we go. Verses 1 through 9 in Acts chapter 9, and this is the conversion of the Apostle Paul. It says, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven, and then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And so he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now, the first thing we notice about Saul here is his past life. And he was committed to persecuting Christians. We see that in verse 1 and 2. He was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. We've already seen him briefly in, verse, uh, in chapter 7 at Stephen's execution. You remember they stoned Stephen... And it says that they laid their cloaks at the feet of a young man named Saul. That's this man here. He was leading the way of persecution against the Christians. Later in Acts chapter 26, when he was giving his testimony to King Agrippa, he says this, Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. And so the idea that Saul was breathing threats and murder indicates that he was a, a man who was consumed with hatred and anger, committed to stamping out these Christians. 
It was like the, the very air that he breathed. But the ironic thing about his vicious hatred for Christians was that he actually thought he was doing the work of God. Which is often the case when Christians are persecuted. That's one of the things that is going on around the world today. Christians that are being persecuted in Muslim countries, in Hindu, in, in, uh, Hindu countries, they're being persecuted by people who think that they are doing God's work. Saul got the proper authorization from the, Christian, from the Jewish authorities to carry out the deliberate extermination of Christianity. Notice that Christians were identified here as people of the way. That was, that was the first designation given to the believers in that day. Several times in Acts, they're identified that way. And uh, remember the Lord Jesus said, I am the way the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. We are people who follow the way. And his name is Jesus. Incidentally, he is the only way. He is the way. Isaiah said, this is the way. Walk in it. And Jesus said, it is a narrow way. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. This is a narrow way, and we are following the narrow way. And Saul was after those few who were leaving Jerusalem and heading for Damascus, which was about 150 miles away, but he was on his way to imprison and execute those who were followers of the way. Now, mentioning that, I was struck by a section of Lutz's book on the cooperation of the radical left with militant Islam in our country. Lucifer said he attended a lecture by a man named Sam Solomon. Mr. Solomon was a, a former uh, Muslim trained in Sharia law, and he had become a Christian. And he was doing lectures all across the country, warning churches and warning pastors and Christians about the dangers of the Muslim movement that was taking off in our country. Lutzer said in his presentation, he said it was well-researched and compelling and frightening. He said later he had an opportunity to speak with Mr. Solomon, and he asked him, quote, in the light of what you have shared and considering the gains that radical Islam is making in America, what is my responsibility as a pastor of a church? Luther said he pressed his index finger against his chest and said, your responsibility is to teach your people to be ready to die as martyrs for the faith. Luther said, I've never thought of that as part of my job description, but his words have never left me. And loved ones, I have to say that in the light of such rapid changes that are taking place in our country today, that strikes at my own heart. In, in the last five to ten years, we have seen changes that we never thought would have been possible. I don't know what 2021 holds. I don't know what the next five years or next ten years will hold for us. But I do know this, that we really need to get serious about the Christian faith. We need to be ready for whatever the future holds. Because we will be required eventually to take a stand for Jesus Christ. I'm amazed at how fast the culture is changing. We don't want to be the kind of Christian that's going to straddle the fence. We need to get real and serious about following Jesus. And Paul will teach us how to prepare. He will teach us how to live. He will teach us how to love and serve one another in the name of Jesus Christ. And, and he will teach us how to serve and love in the name of Jesus as we enter 2021. Now, in verses 3 through 9... 
we find the details of Saul's salvation. This is a story of how this vicious persecutor of the church was born again, and he's transformed to become the most influential follower of Christ who ever lived. Saul was converted to preach Christ. We will find as we go through the book of Acts that this was his calling. He was chosen to preach the gospel. He was chosen to suffer in a unique way for the gospel. And so we're going to find these elements here involved in his conversion. John MacArthur has an outline. He identifies five phases of his salvation experience, and I don't see any need to recreate the wheel. So I'm going to use his outline. I'm going to change the first section because I think he says the, the first point of his outline is contact. I like confrontation better because that's, in fact, what it was. Because he was moving full steam ahead in his attack on Christians, and he was suddenly stopped dead in his tracks on the way to Damascus when he was confronted by the Lord Jesus himself. He's surrounded by this brilliant light that transcended even the brightness of, his son, of the sun. In his testimony in Acts chapter 22 and verse 6, he says it was around noon. But this light was so intense that it actually outshined the sun. Now where are we going to find a light that can outshine the sun? <laughs> Only the glory of God has a light that can outshine the sun. And he says, all those who were with him were knocked to the ground. And so, make note of something here. This was initiated by Jesus Christ. Note that Saul wasn't looking for Jesus. Jesus came to him because, he, remember, he thought Jesus was dead. He was just coming after his followers. Jesus was the one who initiated this whole transformation in Saul. And so it is with everyone who is saved. You remember we said that's the way it is with salvation. There's none of us that look for salvation. Because we're all, before we come to faith in Jesus Christ, we're all dead in our trespasses and sins. There's none righteous, no, not one. God has to come after us. No man can come to me except the Father draw him, Jesus said. So our first encounter with Christ may not have been so dramatic as Saul's, but he still confronts us with his holiness and glory so that we're compelled to respond to him one way or another, either by rejecting or receiving him. In any confrontation, we have to see Jesus in his holiness. If I don't see Jesus as he really is, then I'm not going to see my need of salvation. I have to see Jesus in his glory. So that brings us, verse 4 is conviction. He sees this brilliant light, he is knocked to the ground, and now he hears this voice, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He sees the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, and now by one simple question, he is forced to face his own sinfulness. You see, God confronts us with his glorious holiness. And that stirs up the guilt of our sinfulness and it brings a, a sense of shame and anguish of soul so that we will call on him for mercy. I won't call out for mercy until I see myself as I really am. And when we find ourselves in the glorious light of his holiness, he cannot, we cannot avoid seeing ourselves as we really are. I'm, I, I'm reminded of... Isaiah, when he has this vision and he sees the glory of the Lord in Isaiah chapter 6, and he cries out, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips and I live in the midst of, a, of an unclean people. And he sees himself as he really is. 
And our conversion must be preceded by the conviction of sin because that's why Jesus died, to save us from our sin. I've heard people present the gospel and they, they will tell you to try Jesus because he offers a better way of life. And with all due respect, dear people, that's not the gospel. You don't try Jesus. We must see Jesus as the sinless Holy Savior and be confronted by the guilt of our sin and his holiness. Realize that it is only through God's mercy and grace that we find redemption. Saul, why are you persecuting me? That reveals how completely Christ identifies with his people. We are his body, he is our head, and no assault on the body goes unnoticed in heaven. He may have been persecuting Christians, but Jesus said the attacks against him were directly. That is something that we all need to remember. If we ever face ridicule, if we ever face persecution, it's not against us. It's against Jesus. Christ so identifies with his followers that he said the persecution was against him. And so he is bound together with all of the members of the body so that every stroke which is directed against us is a blow that falls upon him. Saul was persecuting Jesus when he persecuted his people. So in, in effect, this becomes a sin against Jesus. Saul, why are you doing this to me? Why are you rejecting me? Which is really what the issue is. Since Christ offered himself for the sins of the world, the question becomes, what have you done with Christ? Remember we saw last week, he that has a son has life. He that does not have the son does not have life. The work of the Holy Spirit in John chapter 16, our Lord said, is to convict the world of sin because they believe not on me. And that's the crime of all crimes to reject Christ. That's what Saul has been doing. As he has persecuted the Christians, he is in effect rejecting Christ. That is the sin that he has committed. Saul, you are persecuting me. You have rejected me as the Savior, as the Messiah. Saul, you are persecuting the Son of God, and, God, and Saul was guilty of rejecting Christ. And this confrontation brought conviction to his heart, which led to his conversion. Because his immediate response was, who are you, Lord? You know, he, he acknowledges, who are you, Lord? He knew without any doubt that he was in the presence of a divine being. One author says, it's not hard to believe that he already knew the answer to the question as he asked it. If not by faith, then by fear, his worst imaginable nightmare would have been to discover that Jesus was the Messiah. Christianity was true, the gospel was God's truth, and he had been fighting God. When Saul heard the words, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, the light of truth was confirmed in his soul and the gospel became positive. Immediately, Saul's resistance was crushed. His heart was broken. He knew he was guilty. But he was also healed by faith. Everything he had so fervently believed and pursued became irrelevant. Because now he had come to believe that the gospel was true. It doesn't state so here, but as you read the text, that becomes evident. He would later write in Philippians, he says, But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. He had 
all the accolades, all the achievements of an accomplished Pharisee. And it was all irrelevant right now. He says, yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. He had come to realize that. But up until this moment he was, a, he was proud of everything that he had accomplished. He was full of zeal of the things that he had believed but with what he, what he was seeing with this new sect from the people of the way it was pretty evident that he couldn't refute that anymore. That's why these next words from the Lord were so stinging. They struck a nerve. Jesus said to him, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. Goads were used on cattle and oxen when, when they wouldn't move. They, they were just pointed sticks used to keep them moving. They would poke them. An ox could, they could resist the goad, but it would hurt the, the cattle. It wouldn't hurt the goad. So to kick against the goads meant to inflict pain on yourself by continuing to do what you do. He was literally bashing his own conscience by resisting God. That's what he's saying. You've been resisting God this whole time. Why are you fighting against God? Why are you rebelling against God? It's hard for you to do that. Deep down, apparently, Saul must have known, must have had this sense that he was rebelling against God. Jesus is saying, you know, it's tough to keep doing what you're doing, Saul, isn't it? When you think about the powerful testimony of Stephen... When he was preaching and, and, and showing that Jesus Christ was the Messiah as he was preaching from the Old Testament. Saul, you saw the triumphant way in which he gave up his life for my cause. Saul, you, your conscience is telling you that these Christians are right. But the goads of pride and prejudice and ambition, they kept driving you on. Deep inside, Saul must have sensed that the gospel was true. And Jesus called him on it. It's hard for you to kick against the goats. And you know, there are people that are hearing the gospel. And they're kicking against the goats because deep down inside they know it's the truth. But they keep fighting it. They enjoy their sin their pride won't let them give in to it for whatever reason. Some of you can remember resisting the gospel. Maybe the goads of fear or anger or pride for whatever reason. But you can't win. Saul finally realized that he was fighting against God and not for God. And he finally realized. So, he acknowledged. And MacArthur writes this. He says, the horrible truth flashed on his mind. Jesus, who went about doing good and healing all those oppressed of the devil... Jesus who was crucified, who was rejected by the nation, the same Jesus that dying Stephen beheld and into whose hand, into whose hand he committed his spirit, that Jesus whom he saw so hated and whose followers he so mercilessly and cruelly persecuted is alive and he is the Messiah that he claimed to be. And so right there he was converted. But now conversion is the miracle of a moment, but that's, that's just the beginning. That's just the first step. After conversion comes consecration. Verses 6 through 8. That simply means surrender. 
But surrender demonstrates the genuineness of salvation. Because Saul said, Lord, what would you have me to do? Incidentally, that's really the only thing we should say to the Lord. You know, there's two words that don't go together, and that's no Lord. If he's Lord, you should say yes. When salvation is real, there comes this understanding that Jesus is Lord. You may not understand all that that entails, but there is this sense that he is master. That he is divine and you have this obligation to surrender to him. The old Saul is dead and the new Saul would become known as Paul. And he has now risen with Christ and Jesus told him to go into the city and he would be told what to do next. There was no more questioning about what he needed to do. There was just a willingness to obey. But he had to be blinded to be led into the city. Before he was blind to the truth, even though he could see physically. Now he sees the truth spiritually, but he's blinded physically. His spiritual eyes were open, but his physical eyes were blinded. And it's interesting that the other men were with him They saw the light, but they didn't see the Lord. They heard the voice, but they didn't understand what was being said. And that's the way it is a lot of times. You can be in a group setting, and Jesus Christ can be speaking to one person, and everybody else can hear the same message, but they don't respond. But you know what? This was a message. Jesus was speaking to Saul right there. That was his moment. That was his calling. Now, it may be that some of these other men got saved later on, but right then and there, this was for Saul. It was a unique call for him. But you know what? The truth of the matter is that every one of us has a unique call. You know, when we think about our salvation experience, God has a plan for every one of us. And I hope you understand that. God saved you because he has something specific for you to do. I remember the day when I fully surrendered to the Lord Jesus. I surrendered to do whatever it was that God wanted me to do. Now, I didn't know what that was until about a year and a half later. when he called me to pastoral ministry. Now, I didn't have a a Damascus Road experience. I didn't see a bright light, and I didn't hear an audible voice. But I did... uh, I did hear God speaking to me quietly through the words of a hymn. He confirmed it in my heart as we sung it. And I surrendered to what God wanted me to do. And I began to pursue it. And that's why I'm here today. But for us to find out what it is that God wants to do, it requires us to surrender. Paul would later write this to Timothy. There we go. He said, and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. However, for this reason I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering, 
as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. And then, out of that came communion. Verse 9 says, And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Verse 11 says that he would be found praying. God set him aside for three days to give him an opportunity to catch up with what had just happened. I mean, he, you know, he just had a a radical makeover to go from where he was to where God wanted him to be there's nothing short of stupendously miraculous and salvation happens in an instant but it takes a long time to plumb the depths of what it really means you know I can remember when I got saved there was so much of my past life that I had to unlearn. I mean, there was so much garbage. And truthfully, here I am 40 years later, and there's still stuff that's stuck in there that rises up to the surface every now and then. Now, thankfully, it's so far gone and out that it's rare that it comes along. But it's still there. But the only way to get rid of it is by spending time with Jesus. Here's another footnote. And I read this and I, I thought, man, this is rich. It just blessed my heart. Have you ever uh, tried looking at the sun and then when you look away, all you can see is the sun? You know, all you can see is just the light of the sun. I mean, that's kind of stupid to do something like that. But or, you, or, or you're standing for a picture and you're looking and all of a sudden the flash bulb and then you look away and all you can see is the flash. Well, it says that Saul was blinded. And, uh, but it was suggested that Saul's blindness was not the blindness of darkness, but rather it was the blindness of light. That for three days, all he could see was the light of the sun, S-O-N. I never really thought of it that way, but I like that. He could not get rid of the vision of Jesus that he had seen. That was all he could see for three days in his blindness. He spent time with Jesus. He spent three days getting acquainted with Jesus. And that's when all the old things died. Now, I don't think he fully understood forgiveness yet because... Later on in his ministry and some of his epistles, he still talks about some of the things that he did. But out of this new communion with Jesus, he would begin to fathom the depths of God's full mercy. Because he would write in Romans 11.33, all oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. In three days of communion with Jesus, he learned much. But he would continue to learn much. And that's why he said in Philippians, he would say that, that I might know him. That was his longing. That was his passion to know Jesus more and more and more. And you can only begin to understand by spending time with Jesus in sweet communion. So can I challenge you this morning? Here we are about ready to say goodbye to 2020. Hallelujah. 
but we're getting ready to enter 2021. So would you enter this new year in sweet communion with Jesus? Would you make it a priority at the end of 2020 to draw as close to him as you possibly can? We've got, we've got no idea what's in store for us in 2021. 2020 was hard on everyone. Harder for some than others, but loved ones as followers of the way. The only way that we can be ready for whatever is coming is to draw close to Jesus. James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And the nearer you are to him, the more prepared you will be for whatever comes our way. And as we go through the book of Acts, we will witness Paul become the great apostle to the Gentiles. But in my humble opinion, He's the greatest example of what it means to be a follower of Christ. And my, my prayer is that we will learn much from this champion for Christ. Confrontation, conviction, conversion, consecration, and communion. And I pray that all of us are in that communion stage. And salvation is the miracle of a moment that leads to a lifelong experience of service and fellowship with Jesus Christ. And it's all because of his amazing grace. Amen. Let's pray together. Our Father, thank you for leaving this written record of this great apostle, this man who was such a, a vicious tormentor in the church, of the church, and yet you so amazingly saved him by your grace. If there's anybody who ever lived that didn't deserve to be saved, it was, it was him. But in reality, Lord, none of us do. And so, Father, we just thank you for his example. I pray that as we continue through the book of Acts, we would learn much by way of example, by way of principle and truth to apply to our lives so that we can strengthen our faith, that we will learn how to be strong in the Lord, to persevere under trial, and, Lord, to be bold in making Christ known. Use us for your glory. And so, Father, we pray that you would work mightily within each one of us for the honor and glory of your Son. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Those of you that are joining us on Facebook, I... Uh, Pray that you too would uh, make it a priority to draw near to the Lord for 2021. And uh, God bless you. Lord willing, we'll see you next year.